Hey friends, welcome back. My name's PJ and after five years of homesteading, I have burned a lot of cash. I'm talking like thousands of dollars, but I've also learned a lot along the way. Today, I've got 11 insidious money wasters that even experienced homesteaders are spending thousands of dollars on. This video is gonna help you save money while simplifying your homestead. I'm talking about more money, less stress, let's go. The first on this list has got to be saying yes to free animals. There's no such thing as free animals. There's no such thing as a free goat, a free sheep, a free cow, a free rooster. Free doesn't exist. It always comes with a price. Fencing is a price. Feed is a price. Your time is a price. I know this because I took in two goats and thought I could just integrate them into my sheep flock. They were two cute little goats, they were free. A friend needed some help, I said yes. We just got some goats for free from some friends who didn't want them, and truthfully, I don't know if they're gonna make it here that long. Just two days later, I was regretting that decision because of all the headache that it cost me, not to mention all the excess feed, because I took them in in winter and I had to feed them hay. Saying yes to a free animal means you're saying no to a lot of other things. Because the biggest pitfall that homesteaders fall into is they don't realize that their time is not free. Free animals means you're robbing your own time. About 10% of the time, a free animal could work out. I'm not saying there's no situations. Most of the time, it doesn't work out. Learn to say no to free stuff. Next up, I see this all the time. People buying food for ruminants. Even in the summertime when they have lush pastures, they get suckered into buying complete nutrition, sheep food or goat food at the store because they think their sheep or goat needs that food. They don't need it. The complete nutrition label is not applicable if they have enough food on the pasture and you're supplementing with salt. It's a very dishonest way that the animal feed companies sucker you into buying food that you don't actually need. Ruminants are not like dogs or cats or rabbits or any animal that the only food that they eat is what you literally put on their plate. Those are the things that need complete nutrition. Your ruminants on the pasture, they don't need it provided you're giving them enough salt and they actually have enough grass to eat. If you want to give them a treat, there is a time and place for that. I use alfalfa pellets or whole oats when I need to move them and they're ornery or not ready to move. So I'm not saying don't buy food, but I'm just saying it's not a staple in their diet. If you wanna feed them something else, buy hay. Hay is a better bang for your buck. Okay, another useless bag I see people buying from feed stores is fertilizer. I get really peeved when I see people brag about how green their pasture is only to find out that they use nitrogen for it. Nitrogen is a quick fix solution. If you have a pasture, chances are you have ruminants on that pasture. Those ruminants are gonna bring greener grass. Yes, nitrogen could temporarily get the grass to come back a little bit quicker, but ruminants over time will compound the growth effect of your grass, whereas salt-based nitrogen is going to basically never give you as great a bang of buck year after year after year. In other words, it takes away from the land, ruminants give to the land every year. And if you want something that has a little bit more of a bigger nitrogen hit, run a chicken tractor through your pasture. The nitrogen uh, passed in the manure from chickens is very nitrogen rich and that will help bring a little bit more spring to your pasture. So if you really do want to do something better for your pasture and you don't mind spending money for it, instead of doing nitrogen, I would recommend overseeding your pasture. I really like to overseed occasionally with um, some kind of perennial clover or maybe a perennial grass. Clover is really nice to throw out because it does sequester nitrogen, which is so it's kind of like you are buying nitrogen, but in the form of a seed that's helping soil health and sheep love to eat clover. Nice protein punch. Let's talk about running to the feed store multiple times a week. Hey, I've been that person. It's really fun to go to the feed store. You get on first name basis with the cashier. You make friends, blah, blah, blah. I promise you, you're wasting money if you're doing that. The reason you're wasting money is not so much that you're going so often, it's that you are disorganized with your time and planning. And if you're disorganized with those things, chances are you're not keeping an eye on the finances. And if that's you right now, you're in good company because I used to be there. However, what I've transitioned to now is going once a month, I go with a budget and a shopping list, just like I was going to the grocery store and I get my things and I leave and I don't go back for another 30 days. It saves me a lot of money. This goes right back to your time isn't free and gas money isn't free. Now I'd like to talk about fancy livestock, another issue that I have been in. Novelty livestock or cute livestock usually don't produce more of the product that you got them for and they are oftentimes more expensive and they are oftentimes more fragile animals. The Valais black-nosed sheep, for example, as cute as it could be, will run you about $10,000 per lamb. I'm not interested in paying that much money. Even a fraction of that much money 
is not worth it to me because that sheep probably tastes the exact same as a Suffolk does. That's an extreme example. There are dozens, if not hundreds of other breeds out there that fall into similar camps. Just because they're cute or have a novelty aspect does not mean that they're a good livestock, particularly if they're your first introduction into that specific animal. And I'm guilty of this too, because I've had my eye on the Highland cow for a very long time. And who can blame me? I mean, they're really cool cows and they're actually decent beef cows. However, I live in North Carolina and I have to imagine that that shaggy coat doesn't like the sunshine or the heat or the humidity of the North Carolina summer. I see a lot more people around me raising either Angus or Hereford or some other kind of more typical meat variety. So as cool as the Highland cow is, I don't have my eye on one right now. However, prove me wrong. If any of you knows differently, I'd love to be convinced that I should be getting a Highland cow, but my gut tells me I need to Especially for my first cow, I should be getting something more typical like an Angus. Speaking of animals, let me talk about the most divisive topic on this, and that is the veterinarian. I think that vets are a really great way to waste money on a homestead. How do I know that? Because I've been there. I've just found that a vet has never actually prevented any loss or saved an animal. Usually when an animal is sick enough for me to notice signs and get a vet out here, it's too late. Um, this has always been with sheep for me, but every time I've had the vet out there, that animal eventually ends up dying. And they leave you with a bunch of homework of shots and regimens and separating and diets that you gotta give them. And again, in every case for me, the sheep has still died anyway. You're left with a bunch of homework and like a bill for $300 per visit. In one summer alone, I paid over $1,000 to the vet and lost three sheep. Caveat, I'm not saying never call the vet. I'm just saying I learned my lesson and I don't call the vet anymore because it's a waste of money for me personally. I'm not alone on that, by the way. If you listen to anything like Joel Salatin, for example, he and I are of the same mindset on this. He's told a lot of stories where the vet usually just isn't worth it. Let's talk about buying stuff when a DIY option would have worked better. Quick example, for my sheep, I bought a portable uh, sheep structure from Shelter Logic. It was really good, it was sturdy, it took forever to set up, but um, for a summer, it was really good at keeping them uh, dry and in the shade when I'd move them from paddock to paddock. Then a storm came, and I knew the storm was coming, and we you know, pounded it into the ground. Um, I even bungeed it and tie downed it to the trees surrounding it, and even still, after the big storm, the wind took it and it was just like a sail, turned it on its side, completely destroyed and unusual. Even the tarp itself was ripped, all the metal was bent, totally done. $250 didn't even last me one season. And I think to be fair, aside from disassembling it, I did everything that I could to keep it from blowing over. And then I learned about this really magical thing called a camping tarp. Um, I went to Lowe's the next weekend. I bought a camping tarp, a couple of T-posts and bungee cords. And for $60, I built something that is actually more portable takes less time to set up and move and has lasted me four years since then. So compare that, $250 didn't even last me a summer, $60 has lasted me two plus years. That's just one example. There are about a dozen more I can think of, but DIY usually is actually better. So if you think you can build something for cheaper, I bet you can because you're a smart person, I can tell. Let's talk about seed catalogs. So picture this, it's winter, it's cold, and you are excited for spring. You're sitting down by the fire. You open up that seed catalog that they send you in the mail. You're so excited and your heart swoons over the latest variety of heirloom cherry tomatoes. So you put it in the cart on your computer and then you put another 12 varieties of tomatoes in your cart and then another 20 vegetables on top of that. And you tell yourself, yeah, this is about $250, about one week's worth of groceries. But you know what? This is gonna be a lot cheaper in the summer when I'm not going to the grocery store or the farmer's market, I'm dealing with this abundance. I'm gonna be canning everything. I'm gonna be making pickles and tomato sauce and look how smart I am. I'm a good planner and you pat yourself on the back. Reality check. That is a really good way to waste money. I have done that almost every single year. It is something that is so easy to fall into. And then when planting time comes around, you hurriedly get everything in the ground. Undoubtedly, that heirloom tomato that you were so excited about doesn't work and the boring old one that you've had success with for the past three seasons that's the one that works at least that's been my scenario i've just discovered that i waste a lot of money on seed catalog instead the most productive gardeners that i know they really stick to one variety of each plant and they only grow about a half dozen things at any given time so go with what works you don't need 50 different packets of seeds i guarantee you can get away with 10 seeds and have a bustling productive garden this summer 
Let's talk about naming your animals. Yes, naming your animals is a waste of money because when you name animals, you start treating them like pets. And when you treat your livestock like pets, you start making decisions as if they were pets. Give you an example. You have a beloved dog or cat in your house that produces absolutely nothing for you except for, you know, a nice companion. You'll spend a lot of money feeding and caring for that animal that doesn't pay you anything. If you start doing that with your livestock, you're going to be handing out money uh, for an unproductive animal. I remember my first trio of sheep. Uh, I had two ewes and a ram. I gave them all names. Then they had lambs and I gave those lamb names. And then they had lambs and I named all of those lambs. So after three generations, I finally realized how silly I was being and how attached I grew to these animals. I grew so attached that when I moved from Utah to North Carolina, I took so many of those sheep with me. They did not thrive in the North Carolina climate, very different from Utah to North Carolina. That summer, I buried Winnie, I buried Oscar, I buried Diana, and a few other lambs. It's a bummer. Sheep, sheep die and it's sad. So naming animals isn't the end of the world just realize livestock are not pets. An idea for that um, is name all of your animals the same thing. So our rams, for example, we name them all Sean, Sean the sheep. And so it's like, we, we still call them Sean, but they don't have individual names. Um, I have another friend, he names all of his pigs Kevin, as in Kevin Bacon. You can name them still, but uh, not grow attached to them that way. Okay, let's quickly talk about not planning before you build. I know how tempting it is when you move into a property to walk around with your spouse and say, oh, we should put a fence here and a barn here and a row of trees here and a planter bed here. It's really fun to talk and to dream about that, but wait at least a year. Recognize what all four seasons are like on that homestead before you start clearing and knocking stuff down and blah, blah, blah. And I promise you, if you're really eager to get started, there's plenty of stuff you can do that doesn't require a permanent infrastructure. There's electric fences for pigs and for sheep. There's chicken tractors for chickens. There's netting for uh, laying hens. Instead of building a garden box, you can just do you know in-ground beds. There's a lot of stuff you can do without doing permanent infrastructure because when you inevitably figure out that it doesn't work later in that year, you're gonna kick yourself saying, why did I spend all that money and time doing this? The biggest way that I've thrown away money is trying to make a profit. Yes, trying to make money has put me in a really big homesteading hole. I remember our first homestead in Utah on one and a quarter acre, we had 30 or 40 laying chickens. We had three or four breeding meat rabbit like pears. And then we also had like eight sheep at one time. On top of that, we also had like five dump trucks drop a bunch of uh, wood chips on our front lawn. We turned our whole front lawn into a back to eat and no till garden thing. We were spending money hand over foot trying to make this productive so we could make money and get out of the hole. It, it's not a good mindset and it led to so many bad financial decisions and so much burnout. I would have been much smarter on that property to just choose one enterprise, get that profitable and move to the next. Nail it and then scale it. Wasting money is frustrating, but even more frustrating than that is wasting money when you're trying to make money and that will lead you into homestead burnout. So many homesteaders experience burnout. I know I've been there. That's why I made this video where I cover the six homesteading mindsets that lead you into burnout. Thanks for watching today's video. I'll see you on the next one. Maybe even this video.